And as we start here, what I've got in this initial slide is on the left-hand side, you can see Percival Lowell, an astronomer who actually um, has, a, has a connection to Brown. Um, and he was making observations of Mars, and he was mapping Mars. And on the middle part of this uh, scene here are two telescopic views of Mars, and on the right are the maps that he was generating. And what you can see there are these uh, broad regions, but then these lines that are connecting the broad regions. And Percival Lowell felt those are canals that he said were changing with time, and that they were connecting dying civilizations, and these were the canals that were bringing water back and forth. And it really captured the imagination of the entire world, thinking, my gosh, this world is full of dying civilizations, and so surely there's life on this planet. And in fact, it moved on to an entire culture behind uh, uh, thinking about what those people would have been like, and uh, of course, the concept of War of the Worlds, and in the invasion of, of the Earth in the 1930s uh, with these rather dramatic uh, beasts that were coming in, flying on flying saucers with laser beams, right? This was, this was our vision of Mars. Well, let's get some data on this. The first ob spacecraft observations of Mars, when we turned it from a telescopic object to a geologic object, the first observations were not all that impressive. And I'm sorry, this is a little dim here, but it looked a little bit like the moon. And the moon, as we had seen from the uh, exploration uh, with the astronauts, did not really have much life on it. So the pendulum swung, and we said, my gosh, there's, there's, this is a lifeless planet. Percival Lowell, Lowell was wrong. What then, though, get additional data on this subject now. So with new spacecraft data, what we found was, well, this planet is actually incredibly Earth-like. It has polar caps in the upper uh, upper left-hand side of this image is a polar cap. It's made of water ice. And it might be a little dim, but you guys are all going to fall asleep on me here. Um, and then there's <coughs> layers in the lower right, <coughs> lower left, which were formed by changes in climate. Uh, we can see huge canyons that were carved here, which may have been, such as in the upper right, maybe there was a global ocean on this planet. So that really transformed the, the conversation to say, hmm, so it, it is Earth-like. And if we think of Earth-like, it's got all the ingredients that may have supported life. Then in 1996, this rock rocked our world uh, because some uh, scientists identified within that rock some features, four particular lines of evidence, which they claimed was the, was the evidence of life that was caught within the rock. They were fossils, they said, and, and biological signatures that were captured there. And and the rush was on. It was like, oh my gosh, okay, so maybe it's there, but it's microbial, it's tiny, I can't really understand it uh, until we get deeper. So this led to a whole thought process to say, what is the, where does life really exist? What are the constraints and the limits to life? And this diagram here is kind of my three little bears diagram, is that you can't be too hot, too cold, just right. So if we think about life, uh, life and the conditions of life, there's three axes in this diagram to define my little green box. One of them is the activity of water. Too little water, it's not gonna be good. Too much water is not gonna be good. Likewise, the amount of energy you have, you need just the right amount. Energy, too little, uh, there'll be starvation in the middle part, or too much energy, and you'll just start blowing apart your, your organic bonds, and it's not possible to live. And of course, you need nutrients. Too many nutrients will be toxic. So somewhere in there, there's a sweet spot. Did that sweet spot exist on Mars? It certainly existed on Earth and still does. So then that, you beg this question, does or did life exist elsewhere in the solar system? How do you actually go about ask, answering that question? So, put that out there. How do you answer that question? Do we look for radio signals of Percival Lowell's dying civilization? or even much farther from a field from the Earth. That whole search has so far been unsuccessful. How about life detection? What if I send a, a gizmo to these planets and actually try and detect the presence of life? They tried that in 19, sorry, in, uh, yeah, 1976 with the Viking landers where they had life detection experiments and that was fraught with uncertainty about really what was the value of those measurements or to have a systematic, organized process with which we seek the signs of life through exploration. And as we think about that, 
we have three levels to go after seeking these signs of life through an exploration capacity. And each level has a significant component of mapping, GIS, and other technologies that we have to use to make that happen. The first one is orbital exploration, which we've been embarked on uh, for a, a really important period of time and getting increasingly high resolution in there. The second is to get on the surface and explore those most promising areas. And the third is to grab some samples and bring them back to Earth somehow through, um, through exploration. And this phase here of returning samples to Earth is at the forefront of NASA's plans beginning in 2020. The year 2020, the NASA expects to release an announcement of opportunity in the next couple of weeks to request instruments to go on the next spacecraft to help identify what samples are going to go in that cache, a cache, a, a, a canister. So that's going to be a really exciting next phase, and it's not too far away. OK, so here's some heavy geoscience. This is a timeline, geologic timeline. Along the bottom here, GYR is giga years or, or billion years. So if we look at today is at zero and four billion years. Um, those dots on the top show within the Earth record the amount of information we have for when life, when the signs of life we can detect. And they're very, very faint and really hard to decipher. And that's because the amount of rock that we have to work with is about the scale of the island of Manhattan. That's the amount of outcrop available to work with. On Mars, in contrast, we have like 50% of the planet capped, comes from this period of time right here, which we think was the most promising for having had life if it got started, if that signal is there. So as opposed to the Earth, Earth has completely erased its record of when life started. It's gone. We don't know. Whereas on Mars, it still might be there. So that's an exciting kind of how did life exist. And these are the types of promising environments we might look at. Soil horizons. I don't know if there were rainforests on Mars, but in the lower left there, that type of process. Uh, lakes in the middle, or hydrothermal systems are three examples. And so from our orbital observations, we have identified uh, in the artist's conception in the upper right is a lake environment. It has a, a, an inlet that comes in and an outlet. And we've actually identified places on Mars that have that. And one such place is this in, on the left hand, uh, left hand side of this slide is the actual inlet into one of these craters. And the different colors come from the orbital observations of the mineralogy. And the green color is good from a seeking signs of life, because it's got carbonate and clay minerals, which we think are really good for identifying, uh, capturing those signs of life. And on the lower right is an example of a beautiful delta in Russia, just for comparison. So this is that seek part of it, seek. That, that would be a place I'd be totally excited to go. And maybe we can go with our future rovers. But then we go to the in situ part of this, seek in situ sample. And in 2004, the uh, Opportunity rover, there are the two Mars exploration rovers landed, Opportunity and Spirit. And this was the landing of Opportunity. And in the upper uh, right, it was an airbag technology. And <laughs> it was a pretty crazy idea, and it worked really well. This airbag came down on a parachute, and just at the last second, they dropped, they cut the cord, and it bounced across the surface. And we can see the indications of that from the orbital observations that the parachute, uh, uh, back shell and parachute was detected, and then it disturbed the surface with the first bounce, and then it rolled into Eagle Crater. And I don't know if you guys had a chance to go to the golf course this week, because you guys brought this weather with you. And I want you to come back in February, if you can, because you've been superb in bringing that along. Uh, but it rolled into Eagle Crater, and it was named Eagle Crater because of its, it's akin to one of the perfect golf shots that you could have out there. So within Eagle Crater, what did it find? I'm sorry, these are kind of dark. Um, but within Eagle Crater, we can see in the lower right here, this is the instrument arm at work. And then that was the landing system. And what it found were these tiny um, circular beads within the rock when we go from um, medium resolution to high resolution. And those circular beads are formed of the jewelry grade hematite. So those of you who have bought that beautiful black um, uh, hematite jewelry, that's what it's made of, which is a kind of a fascinating 
thing. I'm thinking, I need to go to this planet. It's expensive to go to Mars. It is. <laughs> and, and so I'm thinking, is there a way that we can turn a dollar out of this? So Electrolux is a very good company that makes superb vacuum cleaners. And Tiffany makes beautiful jewelry. So what you can see here on the surface here are all these little jewelry grade hematite beads. So Electrolux will build the vacuum, we'll land, we'll suck them up, we'll bring them back, and we'll sell them through Tiffany's. And that will fund my ambition to find out if life was there. You guys are welcome to chip in too. I'd be happy to have that, that help. So having, dis having identified this really fascinating geologic formation, and there's a really important story that goes along with that that showed that wasn't a particularly promising habitable environment. Water was involved, but it had an acidity about battery acid. So that wasn't really conducive to life. So it said, okay, we've got to move and head on across the, uh, the plains. And so this is a shot of the rover tracks as it's moving forward there. And as it moved along, it encountered some difficulty. As the tracks are coming in through here, you can see that they're getting kind of stuck. And now you can see it's up to its axles in dirt. And here's a close-up of that. And in fact, it got stuck. So those of you who live in northern climates have experienced this potentially in your car getting stuck in the snow. And so this got stuck in the sand dune. And so they had to work really hard. And this, was a, this is a, a complication, of course, of doing exploration. It may not always go according to plan. And I'll do this once more. And I want to just note, if you can notice the shadow moving over the cross, across the scene here, that's every day was passing. So these are the days that were passing that it was just trying to get out of this hole. Uh, but luckily, as you can see, just the last step of that, it managed to get out of that hole and move off. And I'll just note down here at the bottom that this is how we designate time on Mars. Sol indicates a day. So it's Sol being sun, so it's one passage of the sun. Here we are at Sol 449. Got stuck on Sol 449. Before the spacecraft landed, the uh, expectation or the guarantee on the part of the engineers who built this was that this will last, we guarantee it for 90 days or 90 sols. So here we are at Sol 449. I mean, bonus, we got some excellent science that are going to come out of that. But it kept on going, and it kept on going, and it keeps on going, and it's still operating today. Here's where we landed at Eagle Crater. And we got stuck just around here, but it's continued on and went through Victoria Crater and then has been making a beeline to this uh, place called Endeavor Crater. And the reason we went to Endeavor is because the rocks there are less acidic, we hope, and may be more important for understanding um, the origin and evolution of life if it worked, if it was there. And this I put up for the GIS flavor and framework is to map the trajectory and traverse of a rover on another planet is not that, it's not easy. And we've been using a lot of tools and technologies to put that together because there's no GPS on Mars. Maybe we'll do that next. We'll need to put a number of satellites. But it's a lot of dead reckoning, but also determining the number of wheel turns that have occurred, how, and to find the exact position of this on a base map that's being generated by all the other orbital uh, orbital data. And I'll just put this down here at the bottom. One more look at, at opportunity as it's traversing here. And it's been moving. It's been moving along. And it's now at Sol 3344. So that's a lot different than our 90 days that was uh, planned. And this has been produced by the Ohio State University Mapping and GIS Laboratory. So there's a lot of important uh, contributions that have been made uh, to this whole process. And then this is a detail of the Spirit Rover's last days as it uh, traversed the area of home plate. And the Spirit Rover eventually land, ran out of capability and has uh, since expired. Um, uh, but it, it also has, you can see here, an incredibly long uh, history of time that it, it was able to, uh, to exist. Other spacecraft exploration and activities, uh, it's, been a, it's been a vibrant uh, period of time. This spacecraft was the Phoenix spacecraft, which is a stationary lander as opposed to the uh, other terms, tools. What was important about Phoenix was it had a wet chemistry laboratory that it brought along with it. The wet chemistry allows us to dig deeper into the questions, 
did life exist on this planet? I need to understand the, the, the nature of the materials that, that are there. Um, and so the Phoenix lander landed on May 25th, 2008. And it had this complement of instruments that ranged from the uh, imager and LIDAR to look up and see how the atmosphere is changing. And then this wet chemistry experiment, the MICA, which is a microscope electrical chemistry and conductivity, our mineralogy experiments, et cetera. Now, this spacecraft landed at close to 70 degrees north. And it was known at the time that it was going to have a very constrained lifetime. And sure enough, the winter season came and it got buried in two uh, meters of carbon dioxide snow. So this is what happens on Mars, is it has four seasons, like we do on Earth. Um, but <laughs> it snows carbon dioxide snow as opposed to water ice. It does snow water ice, but the carbon dioxide is the dominant one, um, which is, it shows you just how cold it is there. As Phoenix was landing, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures, pieces of data. It captured the rover, a different spacecraft, the, the high-resolution imaging experiment on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, orbiter which has a 25 centimeter per pixel capability uh, to look at, at Mars. Um, it picked up the rover as it was landing right there, which is pretty spectacular. And then as it landed, the rockets cleared away the dirt on the surface in which exposed this bright white material on the bottom. And one of the things that, that drove the choice of this landing site was to look for any solid water ice. And there it is. There's the water ice that it landed on, cleared it away. And so there we, when people say, okay, is there water on Mars? Gosh, yes, there's water on Mars. I mean, we definitely verified it. So we can, we, we kind of joke that if there's another headline that says water found on Mars, you know, we're, we're going to just bury our heads in the sand. It's like, yes, we know there's water on Mars. That's not the question anymore. We know it's there. How's it moving around? Was it related to the origin and evolution of life? So here's a family portrait of the rovers. So as we got into the in situ phase, the rovers that have been on Mars. And in the bottom is the little Pathfinder rover. rover. And if you could um, put a voice to that, you might imagine it could be kind of high pitched and squeaky. And then we've got the intermediate, the teenage rover, um, the Mer Mars exploration rover on the, on the left, and then the big beast here, which is the Curiosity rover, which to give you reference of size, Pathfinder is about the size of a microwave oven. And then for those who have the riding lawnmower, you have your own rovers yourself that you've worked in your backyards or elsewhere, size of a riding lawnmower. And then this is in fact the size of a Mini Cooper. Um, and, and, that, and that required changes in the technology that you needed to, to land and maneuver these uh, particular instruments. And that led to the really nail-biting, nerve-wracking landing last year in, uh, in August 6th of the Curiosity rover using a technology. I showed you earlier when the riding lawnmower size uh, rover was put on the surface, they used airbags. A Mini Cooper will not land with airbags. It's just, it'll just blow everything to bits. So as I was talking to the JPL engineers, I went to the landing, we were talking about uh, at JPL, and we had a really good chance to, to talk to some of the early developers. And I talked to one of the guys who came up with the idea to use this thing called a sky crane. And I'll show you a picture of that. It's like a sky, this, this caused us all to be quite anxious because it's to hover a spacecraft and lower the rover on a tether to land on the surface. Like, where did you ever come up with that idea? He said, well, I was driving into the lab one day, I got stuck in traffic, and there was a, there were, they were building a large skyscraper in downtown uh, Los Angeles, and they were using this sky crane system. And he looked at that, and he said, wow, maybe that would work. As soon as he got to the lab, got together with the engineers and said, and said this is my idea, what do you think? Everyone looked at him like in a stunned silence, you, you gotta be crazy, but they looked at it more carefully, and they said, you know, I think we can do this. That's what they needed to do to land that big a weight, and that's where the idea came from. So be careful when you get stuck in traffic. You could come up with crazy ideas. And that brought, brought the idea of this Curiosity rover. And the, the goals of the Curiosity rover are shown here. 
What is the biological potential of Mars, of this one landing site? Looking at the geology and chemistry, what is the role of water in how, uh, and what is the nature of surface radiation in anticipation of future explorers such as astronauts? So the payload of Mar of the Curiosity rover consists of 10 instruments. I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but I will point out that it's got some really, really, really exceptional analytical instruments on board. It has an X-ray diffraction uh, uh, capability, which we've wanted for years because we need to understand what, is, what are the specific minerals. It has some exceptional cameras that have both telescopic and near and, and uh, microscopic capabilities to look at really close range. There's a, a X-ray spectrometer on board, the Alpha Proton X-ray spectrometer. Uh, but I wanted to point out there's this instrument called SAM, Sample Analysis for Mars, which can do wet chemistry, isotopic analysis, and detect the presence of organics, which we're really excited about, as well as the radiation instruments. And last, on the mast, that purple box you see in the top, has something called ChemCam, which is a, it's a laser system that zaps the rock with laser, vaporizes the rock, and you can measure the cloud of plasma from which you can determine the chemistry, which, which we were all excited to see, and it's working really well. So how do you land this thing? And this shows you how the improvements in technology have come along. The large circle was the error ellipse. That's the uncertainty of where you're going to land. That was for the 1976 Viking lander. You can see it's huge, right? So you, you can only land in big, flat parking lots, more or less. And with the improvement in technology, you can see that little dot in the, where it says 2012 Curiosity. They've tightened it up that much. Now we can position our lander, landed packages into very tight windows, and that's where the excellent geology is going to be. And in this case, we're landing at the base of a, uh, a five kilometer high mountain, which is full of layered sediments. And in geology world, layers are like going up or down in time as we go deeper down the layers, we're going deeper in time. And so it's, it's, uh, they're able to position the lander in that really exceptional position within this impact crater, the Gale Crater. This just diagrammatically shows the, the seven minutes it took to go from 25,000 or so kilometers an hour down to zero. And as it came in with the um, uh, entry, as it just dis decelerated using just the, the ablation of the rover outside uh, shell to the point where it deployed the parachute and then it moved its way down to, in the last step, it cut the parachute and then began hovering. And then it dropped the rover on a tether, cut the tether, tether and flew away. And that's what the upper right kind of shows you, shows you the last stages of that. And so before this happened, I can tell you most of us felt this was pure fiction. There's no way it was going to happen. But um, that's why it was incredibly nerve wracking as we watched and waited for the signals to come down to confirm that it landed. As Phoenix was caught in the act of landing, so was Curiosity, which is just, it's just amazing capabilities of the technology. As it was landing, it had a camera that could watch underneath it. And this is the heat shield being separated from, from the uh, uh, rover package as it's descending. And just, this is a great image, just at that last step, it's hovering. And it's going to lower it on the tether. And you can see the dust being kicked up by the rockets here. So you're actually almost in the act of landing here. And then actually on the upper left of this, that was the first image that it sent back, which, is, which shows the profile of the rover in the, in the fading sun at the, on the Mars surface. And then absolute complete bedlam and excitement because, oh my gosh, this, this crazy landing system that someone dreamed up on the way stuck in traffic actually worked, worked extremely well. I apologize that that's a very dark, the rover was able to take a self-portrait of itself uh, with the navigation cameras. But I want to point up along the top line, you can see the background, which is showing the mountains in the distance that are the rim of this impact crater. <coughs> and compared to most of the other sites we've landed on Mars, this is the first one that has a really e exciting vistas and topography that, that are drawing us in to find out what's going on. 
Um, and again, this is showing that last step as it's lowering the rover on the tether and the rockets are coming down. And the reason I, again, I apologize for the darkness here, I wanted to show up is that on the deck of the rover, you can see all these little black dots. Those are actually rocks that were kicked up by that process and um, uh, uh, left on the surface. And we just hoped it didn't get in any of the instruments that might have affected their, their working. What it exposed on the surface uh, was absolutely crazy. These were uh, sedimentary rock, rocks that were formed by flowing water in a river, essentially. And we can see that just from the first views there. We can see that the rocks are rounded, which is indicated that they've been tumbled, so to speak, in a river. And so not only did it land in a great place, but almost the first results were, we've landed in an ancient riverbed. And then the uh, next results were, as I mentioned, the battery acid situation at the Opportunity landing site is not relevant here. Here it landed in a really beautiful, benign environment for the potential of having supported and sustained life. Where the rover wants to go, so it landed in a safe place. What it, where it wants to go are the base of this five kilometer high mountain, because this is where the really exciting mineralogy and geology is meant to be. In order to get there, it landed, it needs to test out all, it needs to test out all its instruments and find out um, what is the nature of these geologic contacts and boundaries that we have going uh, in here. So in the first traverse, it's been working really hard to figure out the details of the geology on its way to then go from the blue and green dots at the top of this diagram to get to this place called Base of Mount Sharp. And then ultimately, it's going to move up into this, this zone where it appears a, a river channel has carved a canyon out of the rock. And that's where we believe there'll be some exceptional exposure of uh, rocks that will allow us to test and look for those signs of life if they ever existed on this planet. And so um, with this group of, you guys uh, are all GIS professionals, and I, I was really fascinated to listen to you this morning and hear some of the, the uh, challenges that you face as you go out <coughs> about your, your work. Um, and certainly, as you probably are aware, that the whole world of mapping, mapping planetary surface, GIS and GIS technologies is absolutely fundamental to that. And the innovations in GIS that have been brought into planetary science have really transformed the way we understand the surface, including our use of our cave technologies, which is really allowing us to be present and to be geologists on the surface, uh, surface of the planet. Um, and we have to go, I mean, I think one of the really innovative things is the use of stereo technology to get at topography. Uh, and we use laser technologies from orbit. I think we need to get the laser technologies better integrated into this to get us uh, into this. And this was just showing that uh, stereo views from orbit allows us, allows us to determine slopes, which is really critical for the safety and the operations of the rover itself as we go through. And so, the rover, Curiosity rover, has been looking at some very detailed science in this first phase to check out the instruments and to understand exactly where it landed. And the numbers there, the 340s, et cetera, that's the SOLs, that's the number of days that it's been working in these areas. They've finished this intensive science campaign and now they're booking it as quickly as possible to get to uh, the Mount Sharp. And this is, the, this is the plan where in the green dots, Green uh, triangles is where they're going to have waypoints, where they're going to have planned stops, and they're at that uh, green star, just a few um, a few hundred meters from where they started, but they have a plan to keep going as quickly as possible. So, 80 years ago, we lived in fear of the invasion from the Martians. We lived in fear that um, that the War of the Worlds was true, and we were going to be impacted by the Martians carrying their laser beams. But actually today it's the Martians, I think, that are going to be living in fear of this invasion from the humans. I mean, if you look at the, the drama of that landing system, that would be a pretty scary thing to have land on top of you. And, and it does have this laser system to zap the rocks. So in fact, we are zapping Mars with our lasers today. So I want to thank you for your attention. Hope to hope to impart to you some of the excitement that, that we're having in the exploration of Mars, and I look forward to having any questions from you. Thank you.